Welcome everybody to another episode in the Head Acoustics Educational Webinar Series. Today's topic is Noise Suppression Measurement Techniques Part 2. And my name is Jacob Sondergaard and I will be your host today. In a previous session, we covered Noise Suppression Measurement Techniques Part 1. If you missed that session, you're welcome to go view that online on our YouTube channel. Uh, otherwise, I would like to say that it's not necessarily required content in order to follow along with what we're doing here in part two. The similarities are that they both cover metrics revolved around evaluating noise suppression methods, but that otherwise we're talking about separate methods and metrics, and so you can consume each of the sessions independently and separately. Let's take a look at what we would like to cover today. Once again, we try to keep our agenda short and to the point. The first thing we'll talk about is 3Quest. I think most of you guys in the audience will be familiar with what 3Quest is. However, you may not be aware of a lot of the details and background information regarding 3Quest because there has been several evolutions to the 3Quest metric over the years. Another one we'll jump into is the background noise transmission technique, or BGNT, as we often call it, which is a very cool diagnostic tool that you can use to evaluate uh, not only the noise suppression, but other components in your uh, device, your smart telecommunications device. Um, so we'll look at that and ex ex describe exactly how you can use that to maybe reveal things that aren't shown in some of the other metrics used for evaluating noise suppression techniques. After that, we'll wrap this guy up and we'll send you on your way. So let's dive into 3Quest. And first of all, let's talk about what 3Quest is. It is a MOS metric that is designed to evaluate not just the speech quality performance, but also the noise suppression performance with speech in the presence of noise. So you hopefully attended or saw the MOS webinar we have, and you know that there are several MOS metrics out there. Most of them are designed for silent conditions, just evaluating the speech quality performance of a device in quiet conditions. 3Quest is unique in that it is designed specifically for noisy conditions. So it's not actually tuned or designed for quiet conditions. For that, we have other metrics we can use. This is for noisy conditions. It is a very standardized metric. And as I mentioned, since it is a MOS metric, at its root and at its core, we're talking about a jury study somewhere having listened to a lot of examples and a lot of files in order to come up with averages and responses for average responses for a variety of speech quality situations and noise suppression situations. That is what 3Quest does for us. Uh, it is designed to handle both narrowband and wideband signals. And then recently, as of 2017, there was a new standard for 3Quest that now also takes into account super wideband and full band signals. One of the key things about 3Quest is that we end up getting three different metrics out of the algorithm. So where you're used to getting a single MOS score, whether that MOS score is called TMOS, or whether it's just the speech quality MOS score provided by PESC or Polka, 3Quest gives us three. The first one is SMOS, which gives us an indication of how good is the speech quality. We also get the NMOS, which is an indicator of how good is the noise suppression performance. And then we get a GMOS, which stands for the global MOS, which is a single number summary 
of the overall device performance. So one of the ways that you can look at this is that the SMOS and the NMOS are more of the diagnostic elements of the ThreeQuest algorithm. It might reveal things about how good your voice activity detector is or your echo cancer or, or simply your noise suppressor. You can look at those individual components, try and find a balance and strike a balance between different tuning profiles. But if you're simply looking for that overall number, I need one number to compare device A to device B, or firmware version A versus firm, firmware version B, what you might do is simply refer to GMOS. And it's funny, if you look at the different test standards available to us from ITU and 3GPP, for instance, that have adopted 3Quest, sometimes the threshold for quote-unquote passing criteria or an acceptable device is in the form of a GMOS score and sometimes the passing threshold is assigned to a certain SMOS and NMOS value. But at its core they're all, at least GMOS, is certainly related to SMOS and NMOS performance. Now in this session we'll take a lot more of a deep dive into the actual three quest metric and the first thing we want to start with is a very high level overview of what some of the parameters are that we're looking for when we look at the individual components so for SMOS, remember we're talking about the speech portion and the speech quality of our signal one of the typical things we'll look at is what type of signal to noise ratio improvements might we get between the uh, clean speech, the unprocessed, and the processed. We'll look at some of the deltas between there and calculate SNRs. That's a fundamental element in what we're looking for. Uh, similarly, we'll look at things like the modulation of the speech, the overall sound, and the naturalness. So remember, for most speech quality evaluations, one of the elements is, does it sound natural? And I used an example in a previous session about the differences between simply intelligibility, so can you understand the words, and quality in does it sound, not only can you understand it, but does it sound natural. And that's one of the things that the SMOS metric will look at and grade as well. And overall, I guess the SMOS metric really just correlates to the amount of speech signal degradation that will incur from the time the speech signal leaves the head and torso mouth until it goes through the acoustic path to the microphone on the device and all types of processing has been applied. On the NMOS side, we'll still do a very quick look at absolute noise levels where we evaluate what is the noise level during the noise only portions for the process signal i.e. what is the device done to suppress the noise and we'll compare that to the quiet conditions in the clean speech file where we also look at the noise or rather the silence only portions but very quickly we can figure out how close are we to the ideal scenario in terms of noise suppression and of course we'll look at the delta between the unprocessed and the processed signals to get a sense of how good is the improvement from the raw mix of speech and noise. We'll look at modulation and pumping noises present in the background noise environment on the process signal because if there's one thing that people do not like, it is a pumping sensation, even if it's relatively low level. So NMOS goes and looks at that, which sort of rolls into that third bullet point on under NMOS, which is Generally, we talk about the intrusiveness, and we talk about the subjective perception of that background noise. And that's really key across both SMOS and NMOS is that subject, subjective and perceptual evaluation. And that is because we do use hearing models to simulate how a human being would hear it, but that rolls into the evaluation of both SMOS and NMOS. Now, for GMOS, it is a combination of the two. So for the older standards, 
there is no, for the older versions of 3Quest, and I'll get into more detail about this, but for the older versions, GMOS is simply a uh, combination of SMOS and NMOS, which roughly correlates to the overall impression of the device. On the later versions, there's actually some calculations performed for GMOS that makes it a little more sophisticated than simply just summing up SMOS and NMOS. Now let's just take a quick walk along the standards community path and take a look at where was 3Quest first implemented and where has it been implemented since about 2007. So of course Etsy adopted it in 2007 into the EG202396-3 standard to evaluate the uplink speech quality during background noise. And the key thing, of course, is we're talking about uplink direction. We're not talking about active noise cancellation or ANC as you might know it in headphones, even though if you're in the mobile phone community, I'm sure you know there are plenty of mid-tier to high-tier smartphones that employ ANC, exactly the same type of ANC as you would find in a pair of headphones. Now, not to get too far down a tangent, but you can imagine that if you look at your smartphone today, the speaker port on your handset is typically shifted way high on the bezel, meaning that when the consumer gets the phone in their hand, typically what they'll do is they will lower the phone a little bit so that the acoustic port lines up with the opening of their ear canal. In doing so, you lose the noise rejection properties of the phone, basically the physical blocking of your uh, cavum concha, basically the, the concha bowl right outside your ear canal. And thereby we allow a lot more noise to enter our ear canal, along with the speech that's being transmitted over the phone. So a lot of relatively sophisticated mid-tier and high-tier phones will employ A and C. Enough about that because the point was 3Quest was never designed to evaluate that. That's, that is a downlink direction scenario. We're talking about the uplink. We're talking about the type of processing that you can apply to your phone that will try to filter out the near end speech, typically by the head and torso, relative to the background noise that you might be in. So you could be in a pub environment, you could be standing on the side of a road, you could be driving a car, a lot of different background noise scenarios, but that's where 3 Quest has been designed to be implemented in order to evaluate how good are your noise suppression algorithms and how good is the speech quality reproduction when that noise suppression is applied. Because it's pretty easy to get great noise suppression scores, but of course you don't want your noise suppressor to be so aggressive that it completely destroys the speech quality reproduction. Anyway, 2007 was the first time we saw 3Quest introduced into the Etsy standard. And then in 2012, 3GPP, which is the mobile phone community, adopted a version of 3Quest, which was standardized in TS-103-106 in about mid-2012. I'll go over the details later, but there are some slight changes from the original Etsy EG202396-3 standard and the Etsy standard from 2012. Afterwards, we saw GSMA adopt 3Quest as part of the HD voice certification program. So most smartphones, if you are in a wideband call and the phone has otherwise been certified according to GSMA for HD voice, you actually see the little HD logo. HD stands for high definition, a little bit of a misnomer, but I think they're riding on the coattails of HD TV and all that stuff. Um, the point is it's a wide band specification with relatively high performance benchmarks. One of the benchmarks they have to pass is the speech quality and noise suppression quality uh, performance as judged by 3Quest. And then the final step was the 3Quest super wide band full band algorithm being introduced in 2017. So the standard model is TS-103281 under Etsy. There's actually two versions, Model A and Model B. Currently, only Model A is implemented 
in a practical solution. Now, if we take a look at the fundamental building blocks of the three quest algorithm, you can see that this is grabbing the old EG202396-3 version, but a lot of this holds true for the later models as well. We have three input signals. We have the clean speech signal, which is the signal that we send to the head and torso mouth. So this is a very known quantity and a known entity. We'll have the unprocessed signal. That is the signal that we capture with a reference mic. So a very high quality reference mic in the sound field close to the mic of the device under test. That unprocessed signal is basically the raw mix of background noise plus speech from the head and torso mouth. And then we have the process signal at the bottom. The process signal is what does your device do to that unprocessed signal to clean up the noise and hopefully improve the speech quality reproduction. When we have those three signals, we can feed them into the three quest algorithm where the first block we've unraveled a little bit is the pre-processing block. That's this dotted line here. For the good old, 396-3 standard, you'll see that if the narrow band mode is enabled, our first step is we want to take our clean speech and our unprocessed speech and we want to filter that through an IRS, IRS send filter. That IRS filter basically simulates the sending performance of a landline phone. The point being that if we are later on to compare our process signal going through with going through a narrowband terminal, we want the reference channels to also be of a similar bandwidth. Now, one of the changes that happened in the TS-103-106 standard was that the IRS filter, both sending and receiving direction, was replaced by one Emson filter, which is the mobile station in filter. It basically simulates a mobile phone performance as opposed to a landline performance. And the odd thing here, you'll know that we have the IRS send and receive filter, and that is because they are actually different for the old landline systems. There's a slightly different frequency response characteristic. And so we want to make sure that when we grab these signals, we feed them through these two, the clean and the unprocessed, we feed through the sending direction filter. And when we have all three, assuming our process signal went through a narrow band terminal, we can then on the receiving side, on the far end side, basically filter them through a receive, IRS receive filter. After that, we have a time alignment block. So while we're normally very gung-ho about encouraging people run delay measurements and use it for time aligning of signals, 3Quest actually has a built-in time alignment block. As far as I know, it's able to compensate up to plus minus one second of time shift. So it is a pretty sturdy block. But in general, if you run your tests as instructed, then the time alignment block will take care of any minutia in, in the offset and align all the signals. The third part is we want to adjust the active speech level for each of the files. And if you recall the active speech level according to ITUTP 56 looks at the amplitude of the speech only portions of the signal that we're looking at. So we're not concerned with the silence periods or the noise periods for that matter. We just want to scale the signal according to the amplitude of the speech only portions. And we'll set that to either 73 dB SPL or 79 dB SPL, a little bit depending on the stand standard. Once that pre-processing has done, we can feed it into our NMOS and SMOS calculation blocks. We can go through our GMOS calculation step and we can get each of our three scores. And don't worry, we'll get into what each of these blocks do. We're not done yet, but this was just sort of the pre-processing to let you know in general what happens when we feed these signals into the algorithm. So let's take a look at the NMOS block. So the first thing we do is 
we take the unprocessed and the processed signals, so those are the two on the top left, and we feed them through the 3D relative approach. The relative approach is a sophisticated hearing model that looks at both the frequency domain aspects of human hearing as well as the time domain. So we take into account both spectral and temporal aspects of human hearing. From those hearing models, we will extract the noise only sections. So basically when we have our clean speech denoted by the C icon here, we know when we are expected to have a silence portion, we will use that on our time aligned signals to extract the noise only sections and do a delta relative approach analysis between the unprocessed and the processed. To that, we will do some calculations of basically means and variances on different portions of the unprocessed and processed signals, and then combined with the absolute BGN levels in the process versus the clean, we can feed that through a linear quadratic regression algorithm to get us the overall NMOS score. For the SMOS side of things, at least as of EG202396-3 revision 1.4.1, so one of the changes that happened from the original 396-3, that was called revision 1.3.1, to not only the TS-103 as well as the revision 1.4.1 of 396-3 was we swapped out the linear regression models to a feed-forward neural network here at the bottom. So I apologize, I jumped to the bottom, but it's an important step. Otherwise, if we follow the arrows, we have a similar calculation method on the SMOS side that we do in the NMOS. One of them is we will extract the speech portion and look at the different SNR values that we get, and that goes into the neural network. We also calculate actually all three of the speech signals. We'll calculate the 3D relative approach and do some delta analysis on the speech only portions. Do a little bit of mean variance calculations between the two and feed that into the neural network. So if you're unfamiliar with a neural network, the best way for me to phrase it is it simulates the fuzzy logic that happens in a human brain. Now, of course, we haven't gone full Skynet and been able to simulate every aspect of a human brain, but at least for the acoustic evaluation of speech signals, we're getting pretty good here. And that's what the neural network is supposed to do. That's what was updated in one implementation of the standard. Now, finally, the GMOS. As I mentioned, the GMOS is based on simply the SMOS and the NMOS scores, and then a little bit of sophisticated maths gives us the GMOS. So SMOS and NMOS, of course, does all this subjective and perceptual effects that occur during speech and noise, and the GMOS gives us that overall global score of how a jury member or a pool of jury members would ultimately judge your product because it's not necessarily equally weighted. And if you've done this enough, and if you looked at enough SMOS, NMOS, and GMOS scores, you'll see that typically the algorithm will favor slightly, uh, will favor the speech quality element a little bit more than the NMOS. In other words, for communication purposes, we as human beings can live with maybe a little bit more background noise, as long as the speech quality reproduction is good. We end up scoring that output a little bit better than the opposite example where the speech quality is not very good, but the noise suppression is good. So we as human beings, our brains fortunately have the ability to lock in on speech. And so the balance in GMOS, the GMOS score, favors that just like the jury did. So slightly tilted towards the SMOS being more important. 
Now for the actual setup, what you'll see is that step one, we need to place a reference microphone next to the device under test. It doesn't really matter if you're in a hands-free situation like a vehicle or a speakerphone or whether you're in a smartphone situation. You want to put that reference mic right next to the microphone of the hands-free device. Then step two, you trigger the background noise and then you start the speech playback out of the head and torso mouth. This is signal number one. That is the signal that we feed the clean speech signal to the head, head and torso mouth. Signal number two, the unprocessed signal, is then that raw mix of background noise and clean speech captured by the reference mic. That reference mic is flat across the whole frequency response. Its um, response is unaltered depending on temperature and humidity. It's a very stable reference grade microphone. And then the third signal, the process signal, is right next to that reference mic. You have the DUT mic, the device under test mic, which will transmit the signal back through the network simulator or the Bluetooth link or however it connects to your test system back for analysis. So those are the three signals that we deal with. Now, as I mentioned, we find it important just to let you guys know what type of updates there have been. The first version of the EG202396-3 standard was trained on narrowband and wideband codecs, but it used a mix of AMR and G722. When 3GPP came and said, we need this adapted for mobile phones, there was a whole new jury study conducted in about 2011 timeframe that focused on narrowband and wideband, but specifically on mobile phone applications and specifically on AMR narrowband and AMR wideband codecs, as well as the EVRC narrowband codec. So basically it adapted everything and updated everything to the mobile phone community, as well as, remember, introducing the feedforward neural network for the SMOS evaluation, the final evaluation step, or calculation step, I should say, of SMOS. Another update was the algorithm went from accepting eight speech sequences to 16 speech sequences. So slightly longer data collection process. And there is some uh, data from the mobile phone version that is cast away and not used. So usually we allow the device eight to 10 seconds to activate and converge before we actually start grading the overall performance. As well, now the SN and GMOS, the total and uh, final SN and GMOS are simply calculated by arithmetically averaging all the SN and GMOS scores for each of the individual utterances. And with TS-103-106, we now also normalize the active speech level to 73 dB SPL. Primarily, the 6 dB difference going down from 79 to 73 is that assumption that if you only have the signal at one ear versus two ears, there's going to be roughly a 6 dB difference. And that is the new listening uh, evaluation guidelines. So let's take a look and a listen to a three quest example. So what I have displayed for you here is in green at the top, the full 16 sample 83 second long speech stimulus file consisting of male and female utterances in its clean recorded state. Then below, oh, I won't play all, by the way, I won't play all 83 seconds for you. Uh, I've just selected two of the different utterances, so we'll listen to a eight second sample. Below, we have in red the unprocessed signal. So that is what the reference microphone captured. That's just raw speech and noise in the test chamber. And then you can see in black slash green, so black is basically the overlap between green and red, 
we're showing you the process signal. And you can very quickly see noise suppression is definitely being applied by this device. That's good. But let's listen to it and let's just get a sense of how good is that noise suppression and how good is the speech quality reproduction. So I'll just play them back to back and then we can move on. The crooked maze failed to fool the mouse. The empty flask stood on the tin tray. The crooked maze failed to fool the mouse. The empty flask stood on the tin tray. The crooked maze failed to fool the mouse. The empty flask stood on the tin tray. All right, so you can see that going from the clean speech to the unprocessed, we're basically just introducing a whole bunch of noise, which can be very hard to separate mentally, orally, for us. Now, fortunately, our device does a decent job, and hopefully you come away with a sensation that, yeah, this noise suppressor or this device in general actually works fairly well. Now, Let's take a quick look at the latest standard from 2017, the TS-103-281. One of the key things is it allows for the evaluation of speech quality in the presence of noise for super wideband and full band scenarios. So basically all the way from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. This may become important if you are dealing with codecs like the EVS codec in the mobile community or Opus in the voice over IP community, or you are experimenting with other communication paths and signals. That's where this would really come into play. So things like FaceTime and Skype, so it's proprietary networks. They sometimes allow for super wideband communication. Another key change is the algorithm has gone away from using the three channel or the three signal input. There is no longer a requirement for an unprocessed reference microphone signal. So all we have now is the clean speech and the processed slash degraded signal where we evaluate the two. That means A, the test setup is dramatically simplified. It's a lot easier to do. And the other thing is, while 3Quest super wideband full band is only validated and standardized for uplink direction, it means we now have the possibility of applying it in the downlink direction, which is something that we are currently investigating. There is some um, updates to the calculation method. So rather than simply using a linear regression or feed forward, Neural networks, we're now getting into things like random forest regression, which is a lot more advanced and based on machine learning techniques. Uh, the database used not only for training, but also for validation, greatly expanded, which means that the new algorithm should be a lot more robust against unknown data sets. And then finally, there was an update to the GMOS prediction algorithm, which now gives us a little bit more information. It's no longer just a simple combination of SMOS and NMOS. So there's a lot of cool stuff happening with the new metric. And so just to visualize this for you, the setup now is pretty simple. It would be exactly like you would do if you're setting up a Tosca or a Polka test because all we need is the clean speech file being sent to the head and torso mouth and then the resulting process signal being sent back from the device under test, and that's it. No reference mic. And of course, we still want some background noise in the environment. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the BGNC, or the background noise transmission metric. So Etsy has standardized these methods, both for the mobile phone community and for the voice over IP community. And the fundamental aspect is we evaluate how much background noise is being transmitted during single talk. And that single talk, crucially, can occur either in the near end, 
which would be an uplink direction test, or from the far end, which would be a downlink direction test. So we use it right now as an added step and an extra measure to verify the performance of the echo canceller and or comfort noise generator. So if we have the far end test, and in the near end, we use it to evaluate the noise suppression and the voice activity detector performance. Now, one of the key things that I have to mention is there's really no pass-fail criteria here. We have some recommendations and some suggestions, but it is fundamentally a uh, analyst-dependent method. So we require your expertise to analyze this correctly. So if you're thinking about using BGNT, the next couple of slides are hopefully going to be very useful to you. So let's look at the far end method first. The idea is that we want to run the background noise for a good amount of time, five, 10 seconds, just to make sure all the noise suppression algorithms are active and converging. And we'll be recording our output at the electrical reference point in the sending direction. So even for a far end test, we're still recording in the uplink direction. The first step is, <clears throat> excuse me, let's do a measurement in the sending direction with just background noise. So all you do is you switch on your background noise system, you wait about 10 seconds, and then you just capture some data. The next thing you do is repeat, start the background noise, wait about 10 seconds, but now we inject CSS bursts from the far end, or you could use real speech utterances like 555. Five, five. In any case, right now, CSS bursts is sort of the default method. We inject that from the far end during the near end background noise, and we capture that response. Then we overlay the measurement graphs and we look in the sending direction, was there any difference in how our device performed when we had the far end speech and when we did not have the far end speech? So let's take a look at the setup. We have a background noise system. For the first step of the measurement, all we do is we activate the background noise and we measure what does the device send up to us. Done, step one. Step two, Activate the background noise, but now we send that burst down to the device and we measure what's the device doing during that period. So the way to interpret that is we can see in gray, that is our far end signal that we will inject. That's the CSS burst. This is just a level versus time graph, nothing super sophisticated. In black, that is the signal that our device transmitted with just noise, no far end signal. And then in green, that's what our device did when we when we had the far end signal and the CSS burst injected from the far end. And then our goal is we want to look at the overall levels and the stabilities during far end injection and compare that to after we had the far end speech injected. So we have a couple examples where we can take a look. So for our first device, you can see that in black, we have our CSS burst arriving at the device from the far end. In blue, we had just the noise playing in the background, nothing else, just background noise, and this is what the device sent to us. In green, this is what the device did when we had the CSS burst coming to us. And you can see that generally, the two match up really well. There's a slight hiccup here where the device does apply some suppression, but otherwise it's nothing to be too concerned about. The second example is a little bit more complex. So once again, we see that in blue, there is a background noise signature, which is fine, it is what it is. But then when we get the CSS burst injected from the far end, you can see the green path all of a sudden stabilizes and flattens out and then releases at the end. 
And so our rule of thumb is roughly look for about 10 dB. If things start to shift more than 10 dB, we probably have an issue. In this case, theoretically, we don't quite get to 10 dB, so it is, we would call it a pass. We would be okay with it. But you can see that there are some curious effects happen, happening. First of all, this situation probably points to the echo canceller controlling the voice activity detector as well as a comfort noise generator. So as the device is receiving a far end signal, the echo canceller says, hey, I'm getting something kill the mic on the near end and inject some comfort noise because it looks completely flat and stable. And then once that far end signal goes away, things sort of start to converge at the end afterwards. Theoretically a pass, but maybe not the best implementation. Now, let's look at this example. First thing is you can see there's a big difference between the signal that is sent to us during noise only and during noise and downlink speech. Secondly, when we have the downlink speech, you can see that there's just pumping noise, which coincides perfectly with the peaks of the CSS burst. So when you the CSS burst goes high, the echo canceller attacks and then it releases. And what you end up with is that pumping noise. So we get a pretty high delta. We get a pretty annoying pumping sound. But the only redeeming factor is look at the absolute levels here. We are way down with very heavy suppression in both cases. And so you might argue, is this something that will subjectively be an issue? And that's where you, for instance, could look at the NMOS scores to see, remember NMOS has gone through a hearing model that will evaluate the subjective experience or if all else fails, you could also listen to it. But this is one of the things that we can reveal using the BGNT method from the far end. Now let's look at the near end because the near end setup is pretty interesting as well. It's the same setup except now in step two, our speech is injected from the near end. So now the head and torso is talking, which means when we look at the overlay between the graphs, what we are seeing is in black, just noise. But then in green, we should see the bursts being transmitted from the device, even though there is noise. So the setup here is equally simple. We have background noise, which we just measure from the device, and we analyze that, step one. Step two, switch on the noise, but now we have the head and torso speaking during noise, and we evaluate that. Those are the two steps, and then we look at the results. Once again, we will be looking at the overall stability during speech versus after speech, but we can also look at the actual quote unquote speech reproduction, at least in a level versus time format, as well as overall stability issues throughout the near end speech. So the first example that we have is a device that maybe takes a little bit of time to get its act together because when you look at the level of the near end speech, you can see it's sort of all over the place until things start to settle about two seconds in and the level gets pretty stable. Another thing that we can see here is once the speech subsides, it takes a little while for the noise suppressor to kick in and suppress that background noise. There's a little bit of hangover time occurring here. So overall, uh, it's maybe okay. It's not a great device, but it's okay. We get speech when we are expecting speech. It's roughly the same level, and there's a little bit of hangover time. Now here's another example. Uh, what we would say is a clear failure because when we inject a near end speech, we basically get next to no speech reproduction at all. Those CSS bursts are barely transmitted to us. 
and nor are they stable. So here the noise suppressor is being probably way too aggressive and there might also be some AGC issues as well. And the final thing is we wanted to show you a very well performing device. This is a clear pass on all accounts. We can see that the speech reproduction is great for every utterance. It's stable in level. The overall noise suppression is good. And there is maybe just a hint or two of a little bit of hangover time on a few of the utterances. But overall, not enough for us to be worried about the device's performance. So if we sum up our two-part series on noise suppression metrics, you can see in part one, we talked about ANR, D-value, and SNRI. These are all single value metrics. ANR and D-value obviously closely tied, rarely used today, but SNRI still serves a purpose, even for acoustic testing, and people still use it today. Then we talked about three quests and the, the many different variants we have. In general, they're very closely linked, but we talked about the differences between the two. These are all MOS metrics, which give you that mean opinion score from a big pool of jury uh, members and gives you the subjective perception. All of these are engineering metrics. And then we talked about BGNT, that diagnostic tool that can allow you to maybe reveal things that are otherwise not shown in any of these other metrics we have available to us. Unfortunately, it does require a little bit of work and a little bit of brain power on our behalf, but we have information, we've shared information here today that could help you get through a BGNT analysis situation. So let's wrap this guy up. There's three messages that we want to leave you with. Number one, remember, three quests is a MOS metric. It is based on a jury study. It's based on real people grading real sounds and real calls. It gives us three different MOS metrics, the SMOS for speech quality, the NMOS for noise suppression quality, and then the GMOS for the global quality. And we can do anything from narrow band to full band at this point. So pretty much regardless of which application you are in, there should be a three quest metric to help you out. Of course, three quest and MOS scores aren't the end all and be all of tools for a developer and a designer and a tuner. It is just one of many. It's a very powerful one. So check them out there should be something that you will find useful and helpful. The BGNT technique, diagnostic tool that helps you evaluate and can look at the performance of more individual parts, regardless, well, depending on whether you're using the far end technique or the near end technique, but we can see things about the noise suppression or echo cancellation performance or the voice activity detector and the potential comfort noise generation that occurs when speech is injected during background noise. And then finally, based on the two seminars, we hope that we've laid out enough information about all the noise suppression measurement techniques that we have available to us as of today, where there are pros and cons to all of them, but many of them are still applicable, useful, and helpful to anybody who is doing telecommunication devices. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and your attendance. We hope you have a wonderful day.